and tell, sis and tell, a whole lot of talk, a whole lot of nothing. Amanda does stand up, Allison's on TV, and when they hop on the phone, you already know it's the place you wanna be. Sis and tell, sis and tell, the podcast is so sweet. Oh, sis and tell, sis and tell, a whole lot of talk about, a whole lot of nothing. Sis and tell. Hey, Allie. Hey, man. What's going on? Well, my marriage turned 21, so Aaron and I took our marriage out for some drinks. <laughs> <laughs> At 21, you deserve a shot. That's right. So we, <laughs> I love tequila, and I did some crowdsourcing, and everyone recommended this new Mezcal bar, which is down the street from us. And I could not get reservations. It would not pull up on their site. So finally, I checked in like a week before. And evidently, they're doing a special event. So I'm like, perfect, a special event. It was a tasting. And it was so much alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They had like a special um, uh, mezcal from Oaxaca. And they had the guys who own the company and like, part of their entourage there explaining things, which I totally ignore. I'm like, I don't need an education. I just give me right. the drink. Can you but just they, give me that glass? <laughs> they, they did like, it was like three shots of mezcal, of different types of mezcal throughout the courses. And oh, okay. that's like six courses. And then they did two cocktails. But I'll wow. tell you, I'll tell you this, we Ubered, we Ubered there and back and the Uber ride there, I had the most interesting conversation with our Uber driver about a ride she had given like earlier that week, only to realize about 30 seconds before we pulled up that she was actually talking to her grandmother on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I kept on, she was saying these things. I was like, no, really? Oh my God. And then she would respond. And then Aaron looks at me and goes, Amanda, she's talking to her grandmother on the phone. <laughs> did she even know you were engaging with her? I don't or, know. Or maybe did she think you were being sarcastic? I don't know, but she we hadn't even had anything to drink. <laughs> this okay. was on the way there. That's hilarious. But listen to what happened to her. She was <laughs> <laughs> that you were eavesdropping. She clearly no, didn't mean no, for she you was to... loud. It was okay. really hard. She had like an, an earpiece in. Right. Right. So I couldn't hear anyone talking. So I really thought she was talking to me. So, and I just happened to <laughs> respond, probably saying whatever the person on the other line was saying. Right. She, she said one afternoon, she got a call to go pick up um, at this, uh, it looked like a school or like an aftercare or something like that. It was a seven-year-old. Yeah. It was wow. a seven-year-old. She got, she picked up a seven-year-old and it, she said it was probably like an in-home daycare and that one of the daycare attendants buckled in the seven-year-old. She had, she was like in carpool line to pick up a seven-year-old by themselves. And, and it was a 30 minute drive to bring this kid. And she like, didn't know what to do. So she was like, as the kid was being buckled in, she said, well, are you coming? And the daycare provider was like, nope. Because you're not supposed to take anybody under 18. No. Who the hell sends their seven-year-old in an Uber by themselves, right? And it's probably an unlicensed daycare because no licensed daycare is like you have to have like your ID out. Like there's all these precautions in place usually to go pick someone up. And she was a stranger. It's not like she was the every Thursday I pick this kid up and I'm the nanny, right? right? She was some random Uber driver. She said, she goes, you know, I have kids. She goes, thank God. He could have gotten someone else. And he started crying in the in the car ride. She said, she was like, Are you okay? You seem upset. Are you you comfortable? You and can you imagine? But well, also it's probably a desperate thinking, parent. Right. You know, well, that's who, what I'm it, thinking. That's My first thought side. is not who does that. It's who is in a position that they have to do that. Right. right? That yeah, they I have to send about their that. kids to daycare. Yeah. I would imagine, I mean, the more likely scenario, I think really, is someone had no other choice, right? Yeah. They're a single parent or something happened or both are stuck at work. They've got daycare. The daycare is going to close. They don't have money to either, you know, pay for aftercare of the daycare or have anybody in their family to pick them up. Like to me, it's a tragic situation, no it matter how tragic. you look at it. 
but um, yeah. you just hope to God. And maybe what they do is they hope it's a female driver that pulls up, and if it's not, they cancel until they get a female driver. But even I mean, then, I mean, but that's just a desperation, don't or they don't right. care, or right. they don't care, and it's easier for them, or or they're desperate, right? right. But I look, cannot... the flip side is, you know, I know both of us have allowed our kids to take Ubers under the age of eighteen. No, I have mer- my kids have never done that actually. Okay, I know one of us has allowed her kids <laughs> <laughs> to take an Uber under the age of eighteen. Yeah, because you know there's a convenience factor in that, but there's also, I mean, you also hope. There's, it's not like the kid's any safer just because they're maybe a little older and a little wiser. Um, but they, you know, I think there's, there are tons of a seven year old. There's a taking, huge, there's a huge difference between a seven year old and a 17 year old. I get it. I get it. But 17 and, and 14, right? Right. You know, there's a huge difference there or 12 to 15. I mean, you can start to justify any age according to who you are, but at the end of the day, the reality is that there are parents and families who are struggling and are going through things that I know the two of us cannot imagine, right? As right. much as we might be having a hard day or a stressful situation that they are pulled in directions we literally cannot fathom. And they're they're doing everything they can to make ends meet and to make sure their kids are safe. And if that was the only way they could get their seven-year-old home, I feel terrible. It makes me want to like track down the parents and be like, how can I help? Right. How can I help get your child to and from? And I hear about teachers all the time bringing kids home or Mm -hmm. being, or people, you know, I just did an event with Girls Inc. in Chattanooga and I was constantly overhearing the staff at Girls Inc. talking about how they were shuttling kids. And these are teenage girls, right? The ones that I was working with from school to the after, to the after school program or spend the night at my house so that you can get to this um, ceremony, you know, on time tomorrow, I want to make sure that you're going to be like, they are going above and beyond. They're just, it, this is right. why that phrase, it takes a village. It absolutely does. And sometimes it takes an Uber. <laughs> sometimes it takes an Uber. <laughs> well, back to the anniversary. So Alan and I are also celebrating a, an anniversary this week, 26 Our, years. Yes. I think I always have to do the yeah. math. You know, anniversaries yeah. are hard because you, it's not like a birthday where everybody is constantly reminding you on Sometimes that day I that forget. this is the day you were born. Yes. I forget which year a lot. I forget I, what day. <laughs> I mix up I mix up the uh, year we moved to Atlanta and the year we got married all the time. Yeah, I just mix up, and this is probably even worse, I mix up the date we got married with the date that I co-chaired a big fundraiser here for our children's museum. <laughs> so one year it was... It was the Amusum is this fundraiser, and it was March 27th, but our anniversary is March 29th. But that whole year, people would say, like, when's your anniversary? I'm like, March 27th. And Alan would shake his head and go, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm like, that's an important date on Oops. the calendar, though. He's like, yeah, it's Amusum. I'm like, oh, when's our anniversary? March 29th. And now that I've confused it, that was probably 23, oh, no. 24 years now ago. Now forever. Now forever I go, is it the 27th or 29th? But now I know it's the 29th. It really well, is the 29th. I understand also why you get the 27th in your head because 27 is a significant number for Batty our family. is so happy you're bringing this up. I it know. is really, it is, He, you know that was in his head if he's listening yes. right now. Yes. It is really strange though. So daddy, all his siblings were all born on the 27th of a month. Layla our niece, the 27th of a month, our great grandfather, the same actually birthday as Layla. Yeah. Then the, I mean, the, but the, that's not my bat mitzvah. Thing. Same day as Layla's birthday and there's, Papa Sam's and the, August but 27th. More, yeah. But there's more 27s. Uh, uh, that, that's just to name a few. And also 27, the number daddy uses when he buys lottery tickets. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's the number he uses for almost everything. Yes. It's weird. And then he got assigned a parking space and it was 27. Did you know that? No. In in Destin, it's it's a parking number, parking space number 27. It says 27 Goldstein on it. (laughs) As it should. (laughs) Well, there's a lot of numerology in Judaism. So I'm not surprised that 27 has been following dad around for a long time. Yeah. So but it two is plus weird seven that all of his nine, siblings were born. Yeah. And nine times two is 18, which is high. There oh, we go. That, you that was find... a long way to get there. <laughs> that, was, that was kind of a stretch. Right? There we go. I'm a numerologist yeah. now. Poof. 
So I have been dying to tell you who I interviewed for my PBS show last week. Oh, who? who? You're not going to know the name, but you're going to know the show that he was with. Okay. So the guy's name is Matt Paxton. Does that name ring a bell? Is he related to Bill Paxton? No, but good guess. Now I'm going to tell you what show he was on. Hoarders. Oh. Yes. I love a good Did you ever watch that show? show? Mm. I did. I did watch Hoarders. He it, was it, was he it's like still on. Was he uh one of the like therapist hosts on what was he his was role? one of the ultimate cleaners and hosts. Like he was the one who came in and was like had his own cleaning business that specifically specialized hoarders. Yeah. And he told his whole story, which I'm not gonna go into detail. It's an amazing story of just how he even got into the business. Basically, and it, there's a great mantra from his dad. His dad said, Look, find find something that nobody wants to do right like an industry that's just totally sucks and then make a business out of it because if nobody wants to do it then you you'll have a niche and he did and not only like cleaning out people's attics and basements and closets etc but specifically he went to his competition and said what are the houses on your list that you definitely won't clean and it was all these houses with hoarders, the hoarders in it, which, by the way, is a mental illness, right? It is, right. It is stipulated as a, as a mental disease. So that's why I'm saying he doesn't just go in there and shove everything into a big trash bin. Like, does he works with them to, to go through it and filter he it does. like they do in the show? Oh, yeah. So that and that's how he started. And the show got him after he already had this established business and you know, created a rapport with his clients, to your point, that they, he really, and he talked about how before the show, before he even started filming the show, he would talk to these families or to these couples or to these individuals at length before he ever stepped one foot in the door. Because it is, it's about trust and it's about understanding and it's about patience. And I said, look, it's not like one of those shows. I love transformation shows, like where you, you go in and you redo the kitchen or someone, you know, decides they're going to, you know, lose weight and, and it's their choice and they've taken hold of their life. If you've ever watched Hoarders, it's really a third party who has called somebody in or maybe the police have threatened to condemn the house. And it's really not their quote unquote choice so much as right. they're forced into this. Like it doesn't kids change. Have called, yeah. Right. It doesn't change their instincts. And a lot of times it doesn't even change their behavior. But this is it is a sad it's a sad show. I told him, I said, look, I binge watch reality shows with the best of them. I can watch them for hours. I said, I watched a few episodes, but then I had to really watch some episodes. Um, he's not on it anymore, but I said, I watched all the, you know, I watched a bunch of the seasons you're on. I said, for every one Hoarders show I watched, I had to watch 10 shows that brought me joy because they're so depressing. It was depressing. Yeah. That really depressing. depressing. But now he does a show on PBS that I'll promote called The Legacy List, much more joyful where he goes in and he works with families who are downsizing. And, you know, if you say, I've got all these things that, that I want to save for the next generation, one of his points is nobody in the next generation wants your stuff. Um, but what are oh a few God. things you can keep? And this is why I knew you'd love this. What are a few things you can keep that have a story attached, right? That really, what's what's your list? Like create your list that you want to be your legacy of five things. And then what are you going to preserve for your kids? Because he's like the china, the silver, the crystal, all that nobody wants. You know what the, the young people do want? They want the jewelry, the handbags, you know, the vintage stuff, quote, like that. So they in can the grandmother's it, closet. Yeah. <laughs> right. Or wear it or, right, or resell yeah. it on Poshmark. But um, it's Records. really fascinating. It, it did give me PTSD. I what about? Went to my basement and started cleaning out. What about what photographs? About what? Photographs, printed photographs. Yeah, photographs. He talks about that a lot because I think that's for me. I've got buckets and buckets of photographs. Did the kids digital want photography. it? I don't think they want them. No, he says number one, if you go through your photographs and you find a photograph and you don't know anybody in that picture, it, you can discard it. Right. The other thing is, you might have a hundred of the same time. Pick out one you know, throw that in an album. Don't, you don't need to keep all of those photographs just because you have them. A lot of our attachment to stuff is number one, because we think, what if we need it? Number two is we already spent money on this and we feel guilty getting rid of it. And that's why he, now he has this whole partnership with anymore. Goodwill. Yeah. Well, yeah, but now he, now he works <laughs> a lot. He's a brand ambassador for Goodwill because he said people feel the best about donating. They just well, want to donate their stuff. That's so funny because that's my, I have material all about this, about mommy and daddy going through their stuff, sending us things. 
and it's like we have we have subscribed to Harry and David, except it's Milton and Arlene. And instead right. of getting beautiful pairs, <laughs> we're getting boxes of crap from our childhood. I don't. I told Matt like about things. that. You did. And then <laughs> oh, I yeah. even say how he threatens. <laughs> Dad would like threaten to send our stuff to Goodwill, and it was like a threat. I was like, I don't want why why I don't want that to end up at Goodwill, right? Yeah, it makes it makes Will sound not so good. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other reality is, and I did not. I, we brought this up offline, so I can bring it up here. I said, you know, out of respect to the fact that Goodwill brought you into Chattanooga, um, you know, is the fact that he admits to and readily confronts, which is, you know. I don't know what percentage, but a good majority of the donations at Goodwill are probably from hoarders and a good percentage of the people shopping at Goodwill are hoarders. Oh, so interesting. The, yeah. So the fact that Goodwill's probably you or know, teenagers rest on the shoulder looking for a cool t-shirt. <laughs> yes. Right. So he says he's able to reconcile it because number one, a hoarder is going to find a place to shop no matter what. There, If it's a dollar store, if it's TJ Maxx, if it's the mall, whatever that looks like, if it's online, a hoarder is going to find a place to shop if that's their addiction. Second of all, you know, the fact that they're shopping at Goodwill means they're employing people who need work. They're supporting people who, you know, could use a, a, a hand up in this community. And so that he's like, at least they're doing it there. So that's how he reconciles, which I understand, which I, I agree with. But he, you know, the number one way he gets people to get rid of their stuff is to say, donate it. I think people would rather, absolutely, I know I would, rather see it go to an, another yes. hand than to a trash bin. Yeah. Also, another reality show, which I think is really the essence of this is that they're hoarding, is the extreme couponers. Because I th- I totally agree. You, I totally thought of that. They, they're yeah. not like getting 50 different items. They're getting 50 containers of mustard. And then putting it in, they have like a a warehouse of everything they get from extreme couponing. Like in what world are you going to use 50 bottles of mustard <laughs> and they right. expire? Maybe all yeah. of them were free or a dollar or something, but they those are hoarders too. 100%. I think they just happen to be very organized OCD hoarders, but yeah, they have a whole different affic- affliction. They, they should be working with soup kitchens, you know? Yeah. That's what yeah. he should be pairing the extreme couponers with uh, <laughs> with <laughs> with soup yeah. kitchens and uh, like you're trying to have a pantry for people who need that food. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did a- ask him like what were some of the most traumatic moments and I said you had there had to be a time where you wanted to quit. And he said, yeah, always, but I never did. That's, that's why they use me because I'll never quit on a client. He said, even the client, you ready for this? He goes, even the client that threw a bag of cats at me. And I said, I'm sorry. And then I paused. I'm just listening. And then I had to, I started laughing because of the image. Very strong. (laughs) And I said, I said, she threw a bag of cats. He said, yeah. Oh, sorry. Dead cats. Oh "Oh my my God. (laughs) Oh, oh, you just leveled that up. That's awful. Oh, That's I can, so awful. yeah, a lot of the hoarders are animal hoarders. Oh, yes. my God, a bag of, was she mad that she had to give away her bag of dead cats? I don't know the impetus, but throughout the rest of the interview, he'd say something and then he'd say, well, that's not as bad as that time she threw a bag of cats at me. So everything was according to that. That was the barometer. But ugh, oh can God. you imagine? No. I'm sure no. he has a hazmat suit that he uses for a hundred percent. I mean that I know now everybody's going to want to like go watch like one episode of that show. And it, it just with caution, right? With empathy, with empathy, some sympathy, and it's a cautionary tale because, you know, now, so I started, I think I started to say, I got a little PTSD. I went to my basement, started cleaning it out. And Alan actually found a company. I keep saying, I just need a dumpster, like one of those giant dumpsters in my driveway for a few days so I can offload everything I've been saving up for 30 years. The problem is even I'm like, but what if, or I don't want to throw this away, or I don't, I want to donate it. This company, and I can't remember the name. I'm sure there's plenty of them across the country. They will deliver this dumpster for however many days you need. And then they say they recycle or donate up to 70 to 80% usually of the stuff that you give them, which I love. So it's one fell swoop. I can do everything. So so I'm going to do that one day. For them them to have to go through everything. That's that's a lot. It's a lot. Well, yeah. You know what I found is also a great way to give away stuff that is nostalgic. And you want to give it away, 
but you also want to keep it is to take a picture of it and put it on Instagram. That's, I mean, you don't, not for you. You're not like an Instagrammer, yeah. but for but me, then what like, does that do? I, I can just look like mommy gave me all these figurines that I collected when I was little, like it was a little plastic snork. It was like a little plastic cabbage patch kid. And I'm like, what am I going to give this to Ruby? And then she has to deal with this 30 years from now. No, right. it's not fair. <laughs> I'm like, so I took a picture of it and put it on. I was like, oh my God, nostalgia. And it like, it helped me capture the memory without having to keep it. Right. right. Cause that's what it is. It's a memory and you feel like you're throwing away a memory. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's it. Yeah. It's our stuff is a powerful nostalgic tool and catalyst, right? So that's why I think when we give it away, we think, oh my gosh, nobody's going to ever remember the memory attached. But that's why we do. We should pick a few things and say, okay, here's the memory that aligns with it. And why are you keeping it, right? What what's what's going to happen to it ten years from now? Like Aaron, I was going through old files and I, I found in there a script from a play that Ruby was in from drama camp when she was like <laughs> seven. And I go, I'm going to throw this away. He goes, Well, why? He he's what was her role in it? I go, well, She was the Wicked Witch and she did a great job. But why are we keeping it? He's like, Because because you know it's her script. And I go, In five years from now, what are we going to do with it? We're eventually going to throw it away. Let's go ahead and throw this away. I'm not right. going to give this to her. She doesn't want it. She doesn't need it. She'll look at it and be like, oh, all right. Why did, you know, my parents are sending me a box of crap. <laughs> from, I didn't even know they right. held on to all this stuff. Right? Gosh, the more and the more spaces you have for storage, the more crap you have. And that's what was so shocking is that mommy growing up was constantly coming into my bedroom and she'd be like, well, what's this? What's that? Um, can we clear this? She wanted she wanted it to look like before there was Airbnb. She wanted it to look like an Airbnb or like a hotel where you'd go right. in. There was nothing out. Meanwhile, if you there was like a crawl space within the crawl space in the attic. I didn't know. You just made a left. And then there's like a sea of things she was holding on to. Like, where does she keep all this stuff? In the crawl space. She probably crawl poor, space. poor daddy, I'm imagining, on his hands and knees yep. trying to pull <laughs> stuff out around the dead, you know, squirrels and such. <laughs> the dead bag of cats. <laughs> <laughs> the dead bag of cats that he threw at mommy that time. Right. God forbid. No, it's true. Like all the stuff I'm keeping is either in my attic or in my basement where it's sight unseen. So I don't have to deal with it because I'm like, okay, it's over there. I'm just going to close this door and not have to deal with it. But Matt would say, back to Matt, you you know, every day, like clear a one by one foot space in your house, right? Take it very slowly because the room wasn't built in a day. You didn't fill up your clutter in a day. Right. So it's got to be it, incremental. It's overwhelming. Yeah. Sometimes I'll just pick a category and right. deal with and deal with that. Well, my problem is I'll pick a space, but then I move all the stuff to a different space. So I have, I do that. I pick a space, I go through it, I clear out, clear out 50% of it. The other 50%, I'm like, I'm going to donate this eventually. And then, yeah. and then it'll go into like a holding pattern, right? It'll go into the garage. I'll put it on a shelf and I'll be like, this is for donation. And I'm like, and then I don't see it for a year. And I'm like, okay, now I can donate it. I have, I have to like separate myself from it. Like yeah. I go time and space. I do this with clothing too. I've got stuff I've held on to, and I'm like, at this point, I'm not going to wear it. Then I give it away, and then six months later, I'm like, dang it, it's back exactly. In style. I know That's my friend hardest. Pam. She just told us that she cleaned out her closet and got rid of all these like dresses that she had from all these decades. And finally, she's like, no, if I want it again, I'll go buy it. Right? Like, but I'm not. I haven't worn it in ten years, or whatever. And I have so many, especially dresses, because I'm not a big dress person. So I really need to just take the plunge. I, I don't know what mentally I'm holding on to it because what you said, I know next week I'm going to go, oh, but now I need that for that one event that I wanted to wear it to. I know. I haven't gone to like a formal event in forever, but I have all these dresses and you know, half of them are more, I'd say 90% of them are from mommy. Oh. They're from mommy. I have all these dresses and I'm in their beautiful cocktail dresses. And I have not gone to a cocktail party in like four years. Well, if anybody is still wearing like the high heels that are uncomfortable, but beautiful, please um, send me a message to sisters at sisintel.com because I will gladly donate them to you. There's some I just can't put in the regular donate pile, but I, I will give them to a good home of anybody oh, the, who, who the is still putting themselves. you can't even dance in. Yeah, but they yeah. look fabulous. They're gorgeous, right. but <laughs> I can't wear them anymore. I'm not going to wear them anymore. I have a dress from you that's a cocktail dress that was also an Alan Lubavitz reject. 
Oh, it, I'm sure was, there are plenty of those. It was the lime. It was lime green, and it had like a like a bubble skirt. He hates bubble skirts. Yeah, lime and, green. And I it, did not remember or this. Fuchsia? Or no, not fuchsia. That's per, that's um, char- It's char- like chartreuse. Huh. It's chartreuse, and it's got like a frilly. It's a lot. It's a lot. I have but so no I. recollection. I'm so glad I gave it to you because I cannot obviously imagine don't you. miss it. I can't imagine you wearing this. I'll have no. to, I'll take a picture of it and send it I to you. I need a picture of that. Here's what I think about. And I don't know if you think about this. Like, God forbid the house caught on fire and you only had time to carry out five items. I know like, what I'd Like, what grab. would you carry out? You do? Yeah. I'm still stressed about what I, mean, I would grab. Okay, what okay, would you grab? So, we're, all living things are out of the house. No, no, living things are out of the house. Okay. So. And let's say five categories. Like, not, I mean, you can't, like, I would say if you want to I take get, your yeah. jewelry, it's not like a necklace. So. Right. No, so I'd say uh, jewelry. Okay. Uh, my computer. Okay. And um, that's pr- and my phone. I mean, which I probably already have on me. My purse. My purse, yeah. right? My purse. Like, it'd be, like, annoying things to have to replace. And if the rest... Caught on fire, I'd be like, this is awful, but, oh, uh, great. You just clean, made me clean. <laughs> There'd almost be, like, a sense of relief yeah. of, like, getting rid of stuff. Man, you know, I've been meaning to get rid of that couch, right? <laughs> it's like a mafia hit on your house. Right. That's what it is, you know? <laughs> like, and it's like, I'd want to grab the stuff that is really, really irreplaceable, and it would be... My, I mean, I guess a computer is replaceable because of the cloud also, but right. like my computer, my purse, because it has all my, like my credit cards and my IDs in it and, and my, uh, and jewelry. Yeah. So I would say, and I used to say computer, but now everything's on the cloud. So I don't even worry about the computer because I, as long as I've got my iPad, I'm good. But even if I lost that, everything could be uploaded again. So irreplaceable. Well, I would say my jewelry because there's a lot of sentimental stuff in there too. Right. Yeah. Um, I would say my wedding dress because oh. I know exactly where that is. Oh, I know and where mine is available and because I put it on once in a while. <laughs> right. Me too. Because we both wear our wedding dresses still. Yeah, and so I'd grab that. I would also say my wedding album because I don't think I have any of those photos digitized. I don't even I have know. Maybe, I have like one framed picture of it, but even that. Um, so wait, how many am I up to? So wedding dress. My wedding album, my jewelry, um, my ketubah. Oh. I think all this relates to like yeah, our marriage, which good. is the Jewish marriage certificate, which okay. is hanging on my wall. Right. That, that's I, that's I would irreplaceable. Grab, I would grab my ketubah and my wedding dress also. Yeah. And then both and then, of them are um, near each other. Yeah. And then along with, I'm going to say the purse thing, really my uh, my passport or really all of our passports. I think that's our passports, pain. our passports are in um, uh, the the safety deposit box oh, well, that's at our convenient. bank. So it's convenient until you're flying out and you right. realize, and it's a Sunday. And you're, like, <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, we need, we need our things. I know. I'll just say like, when you think about it in those terms, I don't, I don't want to think about life in the tragic terms, right? Like what would we save? But it also circles back to what are the things that are most important to you that you really care about? Right. It's like if, the whole concept of yeah. if I was moving to an island and had to start over, what would I bring with me? Which yeah. I don't think I would bring my jewel. I wouldn't care about my jewelry in that situation. Right. right? Well, but also I think of that. We also think of jewelry. My favorite is, bathing suit. Right. <laughs> but as a legacy. Some sunscreen. I do. And I wear and like a bottle and, of tequila. That's yeah. what I'd bring to the island. <laughs> When I say jewelry, most of my jewelry is just fun jewelry, right? Like my friend Maxine, who's a jeweler, like like her stuff like feels very personal to me and very sacred. Even though it's not, you know, the most expensive jewelry on earth. Right. But to it could me, be it's costume priceless. jewelry that, yeah. yeah. Like mommy but, made us a necklace out of granny's beads, right? And, right. and, it was, and it's like that. I better <laughs> save that. I wear it all the time. <laughs> and it's like, and it's part of it's like costume jewelry, right? right. It is. And it's, but it's very sentimental. That was really, what a nice, thoughtful gift that was. That was really fun that she did that. I know. That you can't I find. I gotta go and find now that mommy knows. <laughs> now mommy knows. No, I know. It's there somewhere. It's there. I'm gonna I go put it, it on today. Oh. Thanks a lot, Amanda. Along with my wedding dress. <laughs>
Matt Paxton would say the whole Marie Kondo approach, which I use a lot, you know, does this bring you joy? The problem is for so many people, you'll say, does this bring you joy? And they say yes to everything. So, you know, you have to figure out what brings you the most joy. See, for me, it is what brings me anxiety. (laughs) 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 Giving it away. If I give this away, is it going to give me anxiety? That's more, that's more of my issue. So there we go. We have our own way of Marie Kondoing and Matt Paxtoning things. So. There we go. <laughs> well, thanks for listening to the latest Sis and Tell podcast. As always, don't forget to share us with your friends, share us with your family, share us with your foes. As always, this has been Amanda and Allison with a whole lot of talk about a whole lot of nothing. We'll catch you next time.